Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this service. We bless your name for what we have learned already. We're asking, Lord, you speak to every heart today. And the grace to be obedient to your word, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our lives will not be in vain. Our giving will not be in vain. Our goodness will not be in vain. And our learning, worshiping you, will not be in vain. Speak to us and open our eyes of understanding. Help us, Lord, to know what you intend for us to know. And on the final day, to get to heaven in Jesus' name. But thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let somebody there say, Amen. Amen. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 25. Very important for us to understand what took place here and what the Lord intended that we should learn. Individuals have gone off and they have derailed because they do not understand the root, the meaning, the essence of what the Lord was teaching. Whole denominations in all their branches are veered off the truth because in this passage they do not understand and they do not see what the Lord had in mind. Before I read Luke chapter 10, I'm reading to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Let's think about the lawyer that came to ask the question, and let's apply this, consider what I say, consider who I am, consider my purpose, consider what I'm driving at, consider what I say. The Lord give thee understanding in all things. Let's think about the Lord Jesus Christ that responded to the question of the man. And let's think of what Jesus has said and consider this verse, consider what I say, consider my response, consider my expectation, consider my commandment, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. We're coming back to Luke chapter 10 and I'm reading from verse 25 Luke chapter 10 verse 25 and behold a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him understand that he came to tease to tempt to derail to turn attention away from the real thing Christ represents. And he came to turn attention away from how to really get that eternal life. He came to tempt him, saying, Master, teacher, rabbi. And that wasn't sincere either. He wasn't calling him master and lord because he wanted to submit to whatever Jesus will say. Master, what shall I do to inherit 
eternal life. Not a sincere question. He wasn't interested in eternal life. And he wasn't thinking he wanted to get to heaven. And he wanted the right answer. So he could get to heaven. He only came to tempt. But all the same, Jesus will give the answer. If not for his sake, because he knew his heart. For the sake of all others that were listening. He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Jesus did not give him the direct answer. He said, you're educated. You know the truth. You know the word. You know the law of God. You tell me what is written in the law. And how readest thou? Verse 27 and he answering said thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind let's understand somebody may know the Bible somebody may know the doctrine somebody may know what is written and he may not be false in his answer. He may be correct. He may be right, absolutely right. And yet, not be ready for the kingdom of God. And he may use this opportunity to tempt the Lord, to try the Lord, and to distract the Lord. Even though he knew, here is the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And then he said, and thy neighbor as thyself. Is a summary and the completeness of the word of God. If you look at the commandments of the Lord to the children of Israel, one, two, three, four, for the Lord. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. For your neighbor, for your people. The first four commandments is your responsibility unto the Lord. And if you carry out that one, you will love God with all your heart. You love God with all your mind. You love God with all your soul. You love God with all your strength. The second part, the commandments 5 to 10, they relate to your neighbor. Don't steal. Don't kill, honor your father, honor your mother. Don't lie and don't deceive and don't um, covet whatever belongs to your neighbor. It's a manifestation of your love to your neighbor. And look at verse 28. And he said unto him, that was answered right. But since knowledge doesn't get us to heaven, accurate answer doesn't get us to heaven that you know the bible doesn't by itself get you to heaven you've answered right thou hast answered right this do understand this do go love god with all your heart this do with all your soul this do with all your strength, this do. And with all your mind, this do. You must give the first place to the Lord. Go and do that. The answer he should have given. If he was a person seeking the knowledge of the Lord appropriately, should have been, but I cannot. I have depravity. I have the dynamic nature. I have a sinful nature. I've read it. I've seen it. I want to, to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. Yes, I want to, but I cannot. And Jesus would have told him how to get that done. And then to love my neighbor as myself. 
and the neighbor here is not limited to our church members. Somebody thinks, if I do this to my house fellowship member, I've carried out this, that's what the Pharisee would have done. And that is what the priest or the Levite would have done. A Levite has a house fellowship. And there are Levites there. He would do that. He would do good to a Levite like himself. A priest has a community of priests. And if it is one of them that fell into this situation, the priest would have held. We miss the story, the point in the story. We miss the lesson in the story. If all we learn here is look at our church members and look at a person who is now fellowship and look at our we add a word, our direct neighbor. There's no word direct here. This is just your neighbor. And your neighbor is the person, a stranger you never knew. Somebody there that you just saw got into that situation and that problem. And then you say, that's a creature of God. I'm a creature of God. That man, that woman made by God, I am made by God. By creation, he is my neighbor. By creation, the same God that created us is in this predicament. I could be there. And so I help. That's your neighbor. But understand, even helping your neighbor is the, only, is the second part of what the man himself and such, look at verse 28 again. And you said unto him, you have answered right. This do, love God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself, and thou shalt live. But you can't do it except something happens. Look at verse 29. But he willing to justify himself. Number one, he came to tempt. That's not right. Coming to church to tempt, to try, to destroy, to distract, to turn people's minds away from the service and from the worship and from the Almighty God. That's not right. Coming to tempt. And then after hearing the word of God, justifying yourself, saying, okay, but who is my neighbor? That's not the question. The question is, now that you have given the answer to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, have I done that? Do I put God first? Do I really love God above everything on earth? And then, am I doing well to my neighbor? That's the question. But he wanted to justify himself. Whatever a person knows, whatever a person learns, after hearing the word of God, if his purpose is to justify himself, okay, I've heard, but look at my life and look at what I do. And then is to project himself, that one is not ready for heaven. But here it says, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gave the parable that he gave. And after that parable, he asked him a question. Verse 37. And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Hold on now. What if this person actually goes out with that instruction? This is my neighbor. Everyone is my neighbor. People in my church, people outside my church, people in the synagogue, people outside the synagogue, 
people who are Jews and those who are not Jews, I am now to do good unto them and I'm to count them as my neighbors and to help them. What even if he went out to do that? That doesn't get him to heaven because the first part is still to love God with all your heart. With all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And if he did the one for his neighbor, but he didn't do the one to the Almighty God, he will still have been lost, eternally lost, unsaved. But the question is how can I and how can you love God with all your heart? with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, an operation must take place in your heart. Without genuine salvation, salvation coming from heaven, salvation coming from the Lord, salvation operated and done by the Lord himself. There's no way you can obey and fulfill the commandment of God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6. This is what God had promised because he knew that no man on earth, whether Jew or Gentile, no man on earth at that time or at this time can fulfill the Lord's demand and God's demand without a genuine experience of salvation and a definite experience of sanctification. The man did not try to ask the right question. Of course, that was not his intention. He didn't come to know, so he could do. He came to test, he came to tempt. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6, The Lord thy God thy God. You must belong to God first. You must take the sacrifice and you must take the atoning blood to atone for your sin, to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be converted. Only then you see the Lord your God. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. There's something in the heart that makes every man selfish. Every woman selfish. Every human being self-centered. What can I get out of this? What can I receive from this? There is something in the heart of man that makes man self-conceived. And until there is that circumcision of heart, you cannot even love God your creator with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, that thou mayest live, that thou mayest live, to live, live on earth in fellowship with God, and go to heaven and live in fellowship with God in heaven at last. That's what he takes. But there will be salvation first before you can do that. If any man be in Christ as a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, tell me, all things are become new. That renewal that makes you a new creature must take place before you can even love God appropriately. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. I'm reading here from verse 37. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, this is the first and the great commandment. The first and the great commandment. Look at the man in our story. 
Look at the man, the lawyer. Look at the man, he has read his Bible. Look at the man that is given the answer, and then he ends up by saying, Who is my neighbor? First things first. The first commandment and the great commandment is to love the Lord your God. First things first. And you cannot do that except the Lord has touched your heart, transformed your heart, so that now you put yourself last and you put God first. Look at verse 39. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That is, the Lord raised up the prophets to interpret the law to the people and to explain, expatiate the law to the people so that as they understood the law of God, the first commandment, the great commandment, and the second commandment to love their neighbor, and they brought everything together after the oppression of circumcision had been done in their hearts, only then will they be ready for life eternal. Many people put uh, this story of the good Samaritan and they put it at the forefront. And Jesus said, no one is good but God. God has to do something in your heart to give you a new nature and a new life so that you will be with him and you will be like him. What if it were possible? To have a person be a good Samaritan, but not a godly saint. What takes us to heaven is being a godly saint. That the grace of God works in your life. That the truth of God works in your life. That the oppression of the grace of God that forgives us, that cleanses us, that changes and transforms us, that takes place in your heart first, and then by that grace, you know your responsibility to God, and you know your duty unto your fellow man. But let's even say the man was able to go back home. And he took the decision, I'll be good to my neighbors. I will help my neighbors. I will be like the good Samaritan. Please understand, one branch cannot replace the whole tree. Hospitality, doing good, giving alms, helping people, is like one branch of the whole tree of the Christian life. And that one single branch does not make a whole tree. A branch without the roots, a branch without the root of salvation, and the root of sanctification, and the root of true holiness, that kind of branch will soon be worthless and cast into the fire. The Good Samaritan cannot replace the godly saint, good works, helpfulness, good works, offering, good works, loyalty, being law abiding, good works, being innocent, good works, being neighborly, you have neighborliness, good works, enlightenment, or sincerity, or living a sanctimonious life, superficially sanctimonious, all that cannot replace genuine salvation and true sanctification. Loving God supremely and loving our neighbors selflessly are the fruits of Christian experience with God. I pray God will do it in every life. Give me a good Sunday. Amen. Amen. That's why today we're looking at the message, Possessing True Holiness, 
and love beyond human hospitality. The human hospitality. Companies do it to companies. Governments do it to members of the government from another country. And friends do it one to the other. When you invite somebody to your house and you want to be sociable, you do that to other people too. But that alone, that alone, being hospitable at the human level, being hospitable, I'm helping others, I'm giving to others, I'm lifting up others, I'm enlightening others, I'm doing the best I can to make the lives of other people better. At the human level, human hospitality cannot replace genuine, true, experiential holiness. I pray the Lord will give us understanding. Look at that passage again, Second Timothy. I'm reading from chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. Paul the Apostle says, I'm giving you revelation by the Spirit. I'm giving you revelation from the very mind of God. Consider this and don't go away from the service today with, I'm going to be a good Samaritan. I'm going to be a good Samaritan to my neighbors. Well, good that you do that, but consider what the whole of the scriptures say. Well, I will not be ignorant. I will not be ignorant. You will not be ignorant in Jesus' name. I'm dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the insufficiency of Samaritan hospitality and humaneness. When somebody is humane, he acts in a pleasant way, in a good way, in a friendly way, humane. But now is humaneness. The insufficiency of Samaritan hospitality and humaneness. Number two, the indispensability, very necessary, very essential, compulsory, an essential thing that you cannot deal without if you want to get to heaven. The indispensability of steadfast holiness without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. There are lots of people that can do some things that appear holy. And they can act in a way that appears holy. But there's so much hypocrisy connected with their action, with their lifestyle. The indispensability of steadfast holiness without hypocrisy. Point number three, the imperative. Very important. The imperative. Essential. The imperative. Compulsory. The imperative of scriptural holiness for heaven. Our coming to church, our getting saved, our learning the Bible, our belonging to the church, it's not just to do religion. I want to get to heaven on the final day. And it is imperative, it is compulsory that we know the kind of holiness to possess, scriptural holiness, if we are going to get to heaven. I pray we'll be there in Jesus' name. All right, I will be there in Jesus' name. We'll be there together in Jesus' name. We're looking at um, point number one. Point number one is the insufficiency of Samaritan hospitality and humaneness. We're coming back to Luke chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 25. Luke Chapter 10, verse 25. 
And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, teacher, rabbi, leader, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? What is written in the word of God? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, and Christ said unto the lawyer, Thou hast answered right this doom, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Understand, the priest did not love God with all his heart, all his strength, all his soul, all his mind. And neither did he love his neighbor as himself. Whatever our worship may be, and whatever our devotion may be, whatever our dedication may be, if we do not love God and we do not love our neighbor, we cannot get to heaven. That's empty worship. Look at verse 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Many times people Rejoice in the fact that I'm a member of such and such church. Either this church or any other church that people are proud of. That's my church. Even when they are not saved, they are not born again. Even when they do not love the Lord their God with all their soul, all their heart, all their strength, all their mind their joy and their bragging, their boasting is that I belong to the church. Are you saved? Do you love God without any reservation? In everything you do and how you take the commandments of God, do you accept those commandments of the Lord and walk by the commandments of the Lord and you are not just a superficial church goer, church common. The Levite was superficial. No love for God, no love for his neighbor. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, this is Samaritan, not necessarily a believer, this is Samaritan, not necessarily a saved, sanctified child of God. In fact, we know from the story we have read about the Samaritans. At the time of Jesus, he even wanted to pass through one of their villages to go to Jerusalem. And he said, you cannot pass here. That's when James and John said, why don't we call them fire if you permit us? and it will burn them up. The Samaritans were not known to normally take care of people like this, but this Samaritan, good, not godly, serviceable, not saved, might have spent so much, but not sanctified, and it takes holiness deep in the heart to get to heaven. But a good Samaritan, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came 
where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Please don't forget that we have such people in our land, not necessarily Christians, they take care of people. Some people even raise up NGOs to take care of people who are deprived of some necessary things in life. But salvation is still necessary. Raising up an NGO, helping people, helping those sleeping under the bridge very good helping those who are single mothers very good helping the aged very good and they don't know these people and they raise up the non-governmental organization to help them yet with that we must be born again except him and be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god there's some people that appear honest a man, this is a true story, found that a large amount of money, what had happened is another man went to the bank and he got money and he put the money in a carton. But he also had a carton of drinks. And when or somebody had a carton of drinks, when he was to leave, instead of carrying the carton of money filled with dollars, thousands, hundreds of thousands, he collected, he took the one that contained bottles of drink, and he went up. And this other man came in, when he wanted to take away, I remember now the carton of the drinks belonged to this other man. But when he came to take that, he saw that it wasn't a carton of a drink. It was a carton of a dollars. And so he searched for the man. And he went to the company where the man was. And he said, looks like it is a great mistake here. And the fellow said, what's the mistake? Look at this carton. I think you must have taken my carton of drinks. And the fellow said, this is great. This is wonderful. If we could have all our citizens in the nation, not here in Nigeria, if we can have everyone just like this, it will be wonderful. And then the man with a carton of dollars said, please, don't go. I need to take your picture, your picture and the picture of your wife. You're such a good-natured person like this. And the man said, I'm sorry, you can't take my picture. This woman is not my wife. If you take my picture, you publicize me. I don't want that publicity. Look at that. The man was not faithful to his wife, but was a good Samaritan. And he took that large amount of money back to the owner. The point is, be a good Samaritan that he returned the money is all right. But living in adultery while being a good Samaritan, that's terrible. And so we need to understand that being a good Samaritan is not sufficient. And being humane is not sufficient except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God except you be converted like a little child you will not inherit the kingdom of God and except you repent ye shall all likewise perish Except you be born again, you cannot enter and you cannot see the kingdom of God. 
except ye abide in me. You cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I pray we'll inherit the kingdom of God. But salvation is necessary. Sanctification is essential. No matter what you do, no matter how good you are, without salvation, without sanctification, you might end up where you didn't think you will end up. That's what many religious people say. Look at me. I don't hurt anybody. Look at me. I help the helpless. Look at me. I do this. I do that thinking that the works of their hands alone will qualify them for heaven. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Do I speak of the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? Have you ever thought about that? It's possible to speak in tongues every day, privately and publicly, and yet not have the love of God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And so heaven eludes you. I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, verse 2. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. In verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, all my goods to feed the poor, that's more than what the Samaritan did. You only gave two pence, that is the wages of two days in those days, and said, Take care of him. Any other thing you spend, I'll give you. That's the good Samaritan, but this one is going beyond the good Samaritan. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt for religion, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I pray God will give us understanding. And we will not replace doing good, doing good is okay, doing good is good, but you will not replace doing good or being godly with just doing good. Outward righteousness and being generous, being charitable, being benevolent and doing, performing benevolent acts are good on earth but they are not good enough for heaven. Good works, they're good on earth. Being generous, they're good on earth. Being charitable, they're good on earth. Wanting the best of care for everyone around you, very good on earth, but not good enough for heaven. To get to heaven, we must have God sent grace. Heaven made grace. The grace that comes from heaven and comes to our lives and comes to our hearts so that we become somebody more than a good Samaritan. Good Samaritan, more than that, a godly saint. God will do it in your life. Look at First Peter. Chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 4, verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. But look at what follows. Look at verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. It says, it's good to be hospitable. Do you know there are people, 
the due night hidden secret work. During the day, they don't have any work. And people around think and they wonder, where does this man get all this money? Where does this woman get all this money? It's not clean. They're thieves. They're robbers. But they give large amounts to churches. They give large amounts to charitable organizations. And then that covers up the charitable work, covers up the stealing. Verse 15, use hospitality. Be giving to hospitality. Help other people. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busy body. In other means, matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And when that judgment begins, what's my testimony? I help the helpless. What's my testimony? I serve humanity. What's my testimony? I try to enlighten those who are in darkness. What's my testimony? I take care of the unfortunate people in life. That's good. But on that judgment day, it's going to ask, are you born again? Are your sins forgiven? Are you free from sin? Are you pure and holy? Are you righteous transparently? For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I pray none of us will remain sinners in Jesus' name. You must be able to tell the day you were saved. If you have just been coming to the church, or you were born by parents in the church, and you just plugged in, you just learned the dressing, learned the singing, learned the Bible, learn how to look like a member but you cannot say this was the day i was born again and this was the change that happened in my life you might even as lifting to be a worker who knows to even be a preacher but you cannot tell when you were really born again i'm sorry to tell you all the good works you do will go down the drain on the final day. Your name must enter into the book of life. And you must be sure I am born again. It took place at that time, in that place. And since that time, a mighty change has taken place in my life. And you must go on. Don't allow the work you do in the church or the good things you perform in society to hinder you from sanctification. You must be sanctified. Your heart must be circumcised. You must be made holy within and of course without. I pray for those who have missed it. You will not miss it today. I said, we will not miss it today. Point number two now, the indispensability. That means it's indispensable of steadfast holiness without hypocrisy. Holiness without hypocrisy. There can be hospitality with hypocrisy. That's why Jesus said, when you do your arms, 
when you give things to other people, do not sound a trumpet like the Pharisees so that they can be known to men. Look at what I am doing. I say unto you, Christ said, you have no reward from heaven. Don't allow your holiness to be outward righteousness with hypocrisy. You Pharisees, you make the outward of the platter of the cup clean but inwardly you're hypocritical and you're full of extortion and uh, filthiness outward righteousness with hypocrisy amounts to nothing you dress like our people dress you talk like our people talk you know the times of all the meetings you have you attend all the meetings we have but your heart is not intent on obeying the word of God. You have the outward show. And there's a lot of hypocrisy in your life. That doesn't get you to heaven. Holiness with liberality. Liberality with hypocrisy. Liberality with hypocrisy. You give. You are generous. Some people know you. In fact, the people in the district, they have also misunderstood the word of God because you're always giving, and you give it directly. You don't give it like Jesus said, that your left hand will not know what your right hand is doing. Everybody knows you. You need something, go to so-and-so. You need help, go to so-and-so. We know him. And the fellow is only living on that kind of liberality. A lot of hypocrisy in his life that the wife can easily tell you. The husband can easily tell you. The children can easily tell you. Yes, daddy appears liberal, generous. A lot of hypocrisy. That one doesn't get to heaven. A lot of innocence with hypocrisy. Look at the man. Look at Pilate. I am innocent from the blood of this man. Pilate, tell me about your innocence. I'm innocent. But you surrendered him to the people to kill him. I'm innocent. And you scourged him. I am innocent. And your soldiers crucified him. I am innocent. Because you wash your hands doesn't mean that you're holy you know how to make the trouble and you search the trouble and you set the people fighting and you search the people disagreeing among themselves and then you back out and you're watching them fight and people think you are innocent that doesn't get you to heaven you're not born again neighborliness with hypocrisy neighborliness with hypocrisy I'm your neighbor make a league with me I'm your neighbor, make an agreement with me. I'm your neighbor, I'll do this for you, you'll do this for me. And yet there's hypocrisy, elevation, exaltation. Uh, look at Nebot. Nebot did not understand what was taking place. Jezebel had written a letter to the city. Get a feast together, a religious feast. And in that celebration, exalt Nebot, elevate Nebot, honor Nebot. And then in the height of that elevation, let some two sons of Belial come and say, He blasphemed the Lord, he dishonored the king, and kill him. Elevation. The people, they will elevate you. They will exalt you. They will put you on the pedestal. They will kind of put you on the horse and make you to ride and make you feel you're on top of the world. But it's all hypocrisy, like Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. I pray that your life will not be like that. Service with hypocrisy. Look at Jehu. Are you of my heart? Are you of my mind? Yes. If you have the same heart with me, give me your hand. 
come and see my zeal for the Lord. The people who are zealous, don't mistake that for holiness. They're zealous, but they're hypocritical. And then he told all the people worshiping Baal, and he said, I am going to worship Baal with you. That's not true. Get all the people who are worshiping Baal and put them in the temple in the hall. And then he instructed his people, once they come in, kill all of them. That's not service to the Lord. And then the Bible says, the next verse, after he has done that, he departed not from the sin of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin. And he continued worshipping the calf, the golden calf. Service with hypocrisy. Servanthood with hypocrisy. With your hands at the back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. Yes, brother. Yes, sister. Are you up here, humble, serving? Your servant, everybody sees you as if you're such a lowly servant, and yet there's hypocrisy in your action. All that will not get us to heaven. I pray God will give us understanding. And every form of hypocrisy the Lord will wipe away from every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. There will be holiness in our hearts. And you're not only because of church. You know, you're a member of deeper life, behave, and uh -uh, that will bring hypocrisy. You are a child of God. God is watching you. He listens to every conversation. You're not only because of your neighbors. You're not only because of deeper life. You're not only because, you know, they're looking at me. If I do any sin, they might report to my leaders. That's not holiness. You're holy because you know that to get to heaven demands holiness. And God looks on the heart. And if he sees hypocrisy anytime in anyone, that disqualifies the man, the woman, the boy, the girl from get into heaven. I pray we will get to heaven. And don't forget, the reason why we came to church is to tell us what it takes to get to heaven. You are not here to hear what you want to hear. We don't have preachers here that will tell you what you want to hear. Tell me this, I'll be happy interpret the Bible wrongly and slant it like this and I will be happy. Keep to this confinement and I will be happy. We're not here to make you happy. We're here to make you holy. You didn't say amen to that one. If you're happy without being holy, you'll not get to heaven. But thank God your mind is to get to heaven. I know my own mind. My mind is to get to heaven. I pray you'll get there in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I know you know this word, but what do you think about this? After service, we've had the word of God, said the scripture, question and answer, all those beautiful songs, and a time in prayer, and then the message, and then the prayer. And then after all that, the group pastor has to see this brother and this brother. And they spend hours, three hours, four hours. This one is saying, I can't agree with him. This one is saying, I cannot go along with him. This one is saying, this man, referring to his fellow brother, you don't know him. The other one is pointing this man, you don't understand. We cannot be at peace. 
and they can quote, they can read memory verse. I'm not referring to a brother already, memory verse today, good brother. I'm talking about people in general. They can read the memory verse, follow peace with all men, and they cannot be at peace with each other husband and wife we have to go there our pastors have to go there and the wife is saying this man i will not divorce i'm going to remain in his house i will not divorce but i will never cooperate with this man referring to our husband and they argue and argue and then you face the husband the husband is saying don't mind her she is not born again, and the wife takes that up. I'm not born again. I'm going to expose you now. You are the one. You are not born again. And they can read Bible, and they can recite Bible, and they can answer question, and they cannot follow peace with the nearest person to them. How about the child that is coming to the church and will not stay at home and she will say that's the what i'm going to do that's the place i'm going to go and the parents have no control and then you say you are bringing them to the pastor and the pastor is not willing to see them because the pastor is not in authority the pastor knows that even if he speaks to them they, they will say thank you pastor i'm even happy to see your face i've been wanting to see you for a long time but as for this one i will not obey they do not follow peace with one another they say they belong to a holiness church and it says follow holiness without which no man shall see the lord i think uh, this generation of deeper life is uh, becoming like a superficial deeper life that the word of god and the experience of real salvation and real sanctification is not in the heart and yet we claim holy 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 things will change in every life in your life things will change in my life things will change real holiness saints from heaven approved from heaven will be in every life in jesus name Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 75. Luke chapter 1, verse 75. In holiness and righteousness before him. That's right. Before God. God sees everything we do. He knows everywhere we go. He knows every thought we think. He knows every plan and every project we're dreaming of. And as he sees everything, you know, he wants to see not hypocritical holiness, but honest, transparent holiness. In holiness and righteousness before him, how long? Church, tell me how long? All the days of our lives. Why then do we appear holy in church? We're not holy in the place of work. We're dishonest, fraudulent. I don't mean everybody, but you know yourself. Why are we holy in church? Holy in dressing? And then in secret, we're not holy. When we're alone, we're not holy. Why do we limit our holiness, our honesty, our obedience, our love, our integrity, our newness of life, our separation from the world, and our service to the Lord? Why do we limit it to Sunday, Sunday, when we're in the midst of other believers? Why aren't we openly holy? Why aren't we permanently holy? Why are we not transparently holy? In holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our lives. Salvation needs to take place and sanctification before that kind of holiness is possible. 
it is possible in my life. The Lord will do it. If he has done it already, he will make it deeper and richer and higher in every life in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life, being made free from sin. There must be that experience in salvation and the deeper experience in sanctification that really makes us free from sin, secret sin, deliberate sin, common sin, besetting sin, the past sinful habit, we're free. He made us free, being now made free from sin and become servants to God. Not I service, not servants of men that will come to church and will fear a particular man in the church more than we fear God. We're servants of that man, the servant of that woman. I know what to say. I dare not say that because that man will put pressure on me. I know what to say. I dare not say it. I know what to preach. I cannot preach that because if I do, that woman will oppress me. We fear man. We fear woman more than we fear God. We're not servants of God. But real holiness makes us to put God as number one. Persecution will come. Opposition will come. Whatever oppression will come. It's just for a short time. But if you are really holy, you are made free from sin. You become the servants of God. And you have your fruit unto holiness. And your end will be everlasting life. My end will be everlasting life. The Lord confirm it in our lives in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 23. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's a recreation that we go to God and he reforms us, refashions us, recreates us in righteousness and true holiness. The Lord will do it. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Even as Christ also loved the church. We've read it so many times. Any husband here, after we have read it over and over, that even prays about it, that even examines his love for the wife, that even makes any attempt to love the wife as Christ also loved the church, we read it and we quote it, we memorize it, and any time the preacher wants to read that, we'll say, we know that already. Read another verse. Do we practice it? Here is holiness. Holiness at home. Holiness in the family. Holiness in your place of work. Holiness in your community. Holiness in the midst of the children of God that as Christ has loved us. We make the attempt 
and we prove that we have had the new commandment of the Lord to love one another as Christ has loved us. Again, do you ever think about that when you are acting uh, somehow to a fellow brother, to a fellow sister? Do you think about that when you are behaving in the church, outside the church, in the family, in your place of work, as Christ has loved the church, that you do the same? Think about it. Consider it. Pray about it. Receive it as an experience in your heart and in your life. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that she might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy, holy, holy from the heart, holy from the soul, holy from the mind, holy in your thoughts, holy in your plans, holy in your action, holy in your character, holy in your behavior, that it should be holy and without blemish. The Lord will do it in every life. He is able and He will do it. He wants to do it, will allow Him to do it in our lives in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 24. Verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always, always, always a conscious voyage of offense toward God and toward men. If we have that mind always, not only on Sunday, always, not only on meeting days, if we have the mind always, always for the conscience to be without offense, we'll be conscious of God in every action, conscious of God in every discussion, conscious of God in every interaction we have inside the home, and outside anywhere we are. We will know that God listens to every conversation. He knows every imagination. And He knows every plan. We'll be very conscious of that. And there'll be transparent holiness when we endeavor to have a conscious voyage of offense toward God. And not only toward God, a conscious void of offense toward man in our relationship, in our interaction, and in our conversation. There will be that consciousness that I need to preserve, and I need to maintain, and I need to have always a conscious void of offense toward the man I'm talking to now and toward the man that may not be there an absent man is in his house the way I discuss about him the things I say about him they should not be things I cannot say when he is there the things I cannot repeat when he comes around if we're going to be holy and thank God we're going to be holy. Will be a man, will be a woman, a boy and a girl, truly saved, genuinely sanctified, having a conscious voyage of offense toward God and toward men. This is true holiness, to be godly and to be Christ-like. It is from the heart. It is produced in the heart as God's work of grace. 
it is transparently being holy transparently being righteous transparently being faithful transparently being truthful no lying no coloring transparently being just no injustice transparently being pure transparently loving transparently forgiving transparently merciful transparently humble transparently harmless transparently spotless transparently blameless transparently obedient transparently gracious god can do it he will do it in every life point number three now the importance of scriptural holiness for heaven to enter heaven to be in heaven at last to spend eternity with god in heaven there must be holiness not my meat holiness not so so holiness not denominational holiness not dressing holiness scriptural holiness that comes with a real experience first peter chapter 1 we're reading from verse 14 first peter chapter 1 verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance think about your life the way you talk today is that the way you were talking before you said you were born again former lusts former conversation the way you interact today with people is that the way you've always been even before you profess salvation and the way you give today sounding the trumpet everybody will know that i'm doing this is that the way you did even when before you were born again it says as obedient children now you become a child of god not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation you know sometimes we hear suddenly that somebody has passed on somebody has died and somebody may die like in an accident we pray it will not happen but sometimes sometimes it happens and then you are wondering if the lord is not going to change his word if the lord is going to keep to his word if somebody dies suddenly and he has all through his life in the church apart from when he first came to the church and the word of god was fresh to him fresh to her apart from that time since that time every service is like every other service whatever we hear whatever we learn we shrug it off and then we go away and we forget that to get to heaven as he who has called you is holy he will be expecting you will be holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy and you wonder the people that hear about holiness almost every time every week and they remain with the anger in their heart animosity in their heart hatred in their heart obstinacy in their heart and they remain like truants and they remain like disobedient people 
and they remain lawless all the time and they are hearing and hearing and they remain incorrigible and they remain naughty the naughtiness and superfluity of character is in them and they remain evil envious and they remain sensual insensitive to the watch of god if such people die suddenly and god is not going to look at he was a member of deeper life. She was a member of deeper life. The holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, he never took it serious. How about that? As we know that the Lord can come at any time. And we know that our time to come home can come any time. Would you please pray and have a genuine experience of salvation, a genuine experience of sanctification, and be committed to that holiness because of God, not because of me, not because of church, because of God, that you are holy as He is holy. The Lord will do it. For you, the Lord will do it. For me, the Lord will do it. We'll be conscious of that required holiness every time. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Can we read that together? Everybody, everybody, one, two, three, go. At the beginning of this ministry, many, many years ago, we emphasized and we re-emphasized and we preached it every time and we made it everybody knew about it we said there are dirty things there were dirty things on the television and that those things pollute the heart they made the heart impure and because of that, we discouraged watching television. We wanted to prepare people for heaven. And we emphasized to the people, not just because it's deep alive, every serious-minded believer at that time, from America to UK, even the wives, not members of Deep Alive, they knew that the pollutions on the television will pollute the minds of people, make them impure. And it said for their churches the same thing we were saying. But now the age of television is almost you know, rounding up. Because now, everything you can see on television, much, much more you can see on television, you can have it on your handset, you can have it on your telephone, you can have it on your, on your tablet, you can have it on your iPad, once you are connected to the internet. And there are people, they may not be watching television, but they're looking at pornographic pictures and from the pornography pictures and all the crime that goes on now on the internet there are people who can even say that they are coming to our church and they can be thinking of suicide and they can be relating with another person and this thing they call whatsapp that brings you know you can send any dirty picture to anyone anything to everyone and there are people that say they are saved and sanctified and they are holy and all those pollutions are there on their tablets to make their hearts impure we stand on where we have always stood that the Bible says, Blessed 
are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And if you are having any sin that secretly makes you impure, makes your thoughts impure, even can make your emotion, your feeling impure, and can make you to be committing immorality, even with images and pictures and whatever they call them. I don't want to mention it in my message. Whatever they call them, they are impure, and you're still coming. I'm saved, I'm sanctified. The Lord deliver us, the Lord keep us holy, the Lord keep us righteous that shall preserve the experience of God so that when the trumpet shall sound, I will not be missing. Look at Psalm 24. I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. It's all over the Bible. And so if our coming to church is not just to fulfill our righteousness, just to attend service, if our coming to church is to prepare for heaven, I pray clean hands the Lord will give us. Pure hearts the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus name it'll make you holy it'll make me holy it'll preserve us in holiness in Jesus name Hebrews Hebrews chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 12 Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, not with the work, the action, the generosity of a good Samaritan. It goes beyond that. We must be godly. We must be sanctified. And wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come are you seeking the heavenly city do you want to get to the heavenly city we seek one to come. You will not miss it in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. I pray you will enter in. Verse 15, For without outside are the dogs and sorcerers. Sometimes you accuse some people of being sorcerers. And they say, no, I'm not there. No, I'm not there. Maybe they are not there. If they are not there, praise the Lord for them. But some of them, because of the shame, that word witchcraft or sorcery, because of the shame it carries, they are there, but they don't repent. 
You say, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm holy. Look at my dressing. How can a person like me, dressing the way I'm dressing, still be involved in sorcery? If that's right, okay. But if you are there and you're doing evil and you're saying anything I say, if I say that person, this will happen, that thing will happen. And yet you say you are not a sorcerer. But understand, whatever happens, no sorcerer will get to heaven. You didn't say amen to that one. No wicked man, wicked woman that destroys other people's lives will get to heaven. It says outside, outside the kingdom, outside heaven, are the dogs, the sorcerers, the mongers, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Understand? Lying does not come into the work of God. If you're a liar, Lord, I'm telling that lie so that this good thing will happen. I'm telling this lie, I'm acting out this lie so that the people will run, so that the people will stand up and do the right thing. They may stand up and do the right thing. The end does not justify the means. Hypocrisy and deception and lying are not compatible with holiness. I want to succeed. I want the work of God to prosper. And I want people to come. If this is happening, if that is happening, people will not come. And to make the people come, I tell this lie. The people may come. The church may grow. The money may come in. Whatever. But lying is not compatible with holiness. And the people that trade in deception, in hypocrisy, in lying, if they don't repent, if they don't stop it, they will not get to heaven. Don't say you are helping our church and you are helping us by telling lies. If you do that, you miss heaven. Read verse 15 again. For without a dogs and sorcerers and all mongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever, whosoever, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and the morning star and the spirit and the bride say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely the cleansing water is still available today and the word of God that brings grace into our lives is still available today. And as we come to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb, and we plead with the Lord to cleanse and wash us and purge and purify and make us holy, holy in the heart, holy in the soul, holy in the mind, holy in the inner life, holy in every way in the sight of God. The Lord will do it. That holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, we will possess in Jesus' name. We will preserve in Jesus' name. And as we are preserving it in the doctrine, we'll preserve it in our hearts. Preserve in our family. Preserve in our place of work. Preserve in our community and preserve in every one of our actions in Jesus' name. 
follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Important for you, important for everyone, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord.